Yeah. All right. Welcome to Competitive Coppercast, episode fifteen. With me, we have Mr. Dan Horning. Yeah. And I have no idea what you just said. And David Chaffer. Hey guys, I'm uh, casting from a can again. So he is casting from a tin can once again. Find the can. What have you been up to, Dan? Uh, I just uh, played my first eight mans. We uh, the dailies are coming back on uh, December 11th, which you are very pleased about because your show notes went out the window. Yes. Right. Yes. But I played eight mans. Uh, two of them, uh, first with Trinket uh, and Lord Downey, managed to kill me with the Ramosan Rally. Is that the card? Yeah, the card's sweet. Yeah, I crypt ratted his team and I was like, ha, sweet! And I F6, and then his team was still there, and I was like, what happened? <laughs> and then I checked his graveyard, oh, what the hell is that? Uh, so he killed me, then I switched to the only other deck I played 100 matches with, Stompy. And I uh, played 8 archers in the sideboard, it's an old idea from Enrique Caldera. Uh, I was like, I'm going to win against Delver. So I played Delver in the first round, and I won. Then I went up against uh, Turbo Kitty 3000, uh, famous for his rages. <laughs> I think you featured him on the Rager of the Week on Pop It to the People, right? I think so. And he, But he, was, he only called me a bad player playing a tier 3 deck. And that was despite me actually playing under my own name and talking to him and saying, like, thank you for inventing Boros Kitty, etc. As he was the winning brewer of the Gauntlet, but he still raged. And he was playing five matches uh, at the same time, uh, raging in all of them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and he played Affinity and he managed to. Uh, I think it's a pretty bad matchup for Stompy. And uh, he is a better Affinity player than I am a Stompy player. So he managed to win in the end. He had a lot of bad luck and he was whining all the way, even when winning, <laughs> which was quite interesting. I, I don't know how you manage to have time to complain when you're playing five matches at the same time. Uh, I don't know how you manage to play five matches at the same time. I can't. I can't juggle two. No, I, I tried to as well. I can't do it. It takes all the joy out of magic. Yeah, I can't juggle two if I'm playing burn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I could probably play two with burn. What about you, David? What you been up to? Well, I. Uh... I've been kind of working mostly on playing eight mans during like Mondays and Tuesdays is sort of my window. So I've been streaming a little bit, and this Monday I streamed like three eight mans, I think. Yeah, and I tried. I just wanted to try goblins out, see how that's doing, because it's like before the ban, my goblin stick had a pretty good Delver matchup. Um, I'd never played it against mono black even in previous testing, because no one ever played that deck. It just didn't exist when Fisher was around, so I was like, you know, this is a good time to see how well Goblins fares against Mono Black, and uh, it fares poorly. That is <laughs> the conclusion I came to. Um, I won the the first round of my three the three daily or eight mans I did. I won. I played against uh, someone who decided to bring five color green to the eight man, nice. and so I, I beat him. And then I played Delver, and it was like, I won the first game, everything was feeling great. Uh, then, like, halfway through the second game, I just started flooding, and that flood continued into game three, so I lost. And then, uh, I think I played Mono Black first round of the next one, and had, like, a turn three kill totally lined up, but then he played, uh, like, I don't know what it's called anymore, but, like, Nausea... This is the equivalent, the minus one, or oh, shrivel, is what it is now. Yeah. Uh, shrivel. Shriveled my guys, so it just, like, blew me out. And then, uh, so he won that one. And then I played someone else, and I don't remember who, and I lost that as well. <laughs> but then I've also been doing a lot of one land, one land spy. Um, that deck is just so inconsistent, but it's like, right when I'm about to give up on it, I get like a turn one or turn two kill, and I'm like, this deck is so powerful, so then I keep testing it, and then I get tired of it, and sick of losing, and then it happens again, and it draws me back in, so I'll probably be playing that the rest of my life. Um, but yeah, that's that's about all I've done. What about you? 
Uh, I played a lot of Magic, man. Uh, mostly Delver, but they announced Mercadian Mass Drafts uh, at the end of the holiday season, so I had to sell off my uh, gushes and dazes to make make room for, you know, make money and whatever. So then I started working on teachings, and then they announced Tempest Block Drafts. So, by the way, they did announce Tempest Block Drafts. I don't know if you saw that, David. That was announced yeah. last night. Starting today. Starting today. So, sold off my Diabolic Edicts and Rolling Thunders, so that uh, that kills off my ideas of running Mono Black Control or uh, Tron, so... Moved over to Stompy. Um, and Stompy is good stuff. It's... Stompy is really powerful in the meta, but I keep on countering like, weird things, like... So the same before the cast. I uh, ran the Play Run event yesterday, and I... I brought Stompy, because why not, right? And my round one pairing is Turbo Fog. I'm like, gosh, I can't, <laughs> I can't awesome. actually beat Turbo Fog with this. Uh, so I was raging myself. I was like, man, I should have just brought like a bad version of Delver so I could beat this stupid deck. Um, <laughs> uh, I was playing Stompy in eight mans and two mans a lot, too. So one of the eight mans I went, I won round one because he was like, I don't know, mana screwed or something. And Round two, I play against uh, Grinder. You may have seen his name. It's like Yun, uh, Yun Hao oh, underscore. Chin something. Chin, yeah, something like that. Yeah. I don't remember his name exactly, but um, I come up against him and he beats me game one because he like you know throws about a million four fours on the table and or flings an a dog at me or something. He won one of the standard if anyways. And round two he turn two standard bears me. I'm like, who runs that card anymore? Nobody runs that card anymore. Except for you. So... Turbo did too. Yeah. So he crushed me. It was uh, not fun at all. So what Stompy. else have I been doing? Good against Stompy. I did encounter a burn list that I really like. And it's uh, the Chris Davis burn list. Yeah, you should talk so about sweet. that. It's cool. It's it is innovative. <laughs> I have to log on and bring it up because I, I love the deck. It's it's still just like way. It's still very much burn in that uh, you are going to lose less than or you are going to lose more than half your matches just because you don't draw enough burn spells or you know your opponent actually has like life gain or counter spells or something like that. But what's really interesting about this list is like it's. It goes big, right, for a burn list. It's running Stagger Shocks and Brimstone Volleys and uh, in the main deck. And I'm pulling up the deck list right now. And in the sideboards where it gets really interesting, though. Because the sideboard is almost purely dedicated to beating Delver. What do you think about that, Dan? That's interesting. Yeah. So why, why is the main deck a lot different? That's my main question. Like, I guess the games I saw him play with it must have all been post-board games. Uh, well, the games you saw him play with it on the Channel Fireball page were like they weren't really fair because he played against Elves once and Affinity twice. So, um, yeah, Elves isn't really a thing. So, but the main de his main deck is different. Mostly because of the brimstone volleys and stagger shocks, right? Well, I know I know what cards make the 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 deck different. Like I know that this is not a stock list. I guess my question is is why are the brimstone volleys and and stagger shocks in there? I played stagger shock. Uh, I have no. I don't think that's bad in any way. But well, it's brimstone usually like volley. one or two, right? And he has yeah. like almost four, doesn't he? Yeah, he has four stagger shocks in his deck. I played four stagger shocks too, but oh, you did. Brimstone okay. volley. Yeah, he has brimstone volleys because he has a uh, main deck mog fanatics. Okay, so that he... sounds pretty bad. I don't know because the main deck mog fanatics can like sort of mise wins off of Delver, right? Because you play a turn one mog fanatic and they have to like throw their fairy into it or throw their Delver into it. Yeah, yeah. but is the the fire sling a lot better as a turn one play against Delver? Uh. No, no, but no, it's really not. Like I'm never scared of a turn one fire slinger as a Delver player. But, but the fanatic can't, can't get through anything. 
Yeah, but the fanatic can be sacked to kill something, you know, of Jelvers. So, I don't know. I um, I don't hate it at all. I don't like, like I've actually never liked the uh, the Fire Slinger. I just don't think it does enough. I agree. I'm not a big Fire Slinger fan either. I've played my Shadow Burn, and it was in my four O list with Burn, and I I liked the Fire Slinger in the meta that was at the time because it. But turn one fire slinger can do a lot of damage. Yeah. Definitely more than a mog fanatic. Yeah. Well, the the reasons for the cards are very different. I mean, I guess like the fanatic is for interactivity with creatures mostly. Um, yeah. The fire slinger is effectively another burn spell. It's basically another uh, curse of the pure start that comes down a turn earlier, but is more vulnerable. It's I mean, it's the same type of function. Yep. But so, uh, uh, lately, no one is using creatures in burn lists because of mon black control. Yeah, there's no need to turn the cards they have on. Yeah. Exactly. So, well, it's another reason, too, why I like the Mog Fanatics, right? If they try and target it with removal, then you just throw it at their face. But one damage for one card, that's yeah. a very bad deal in burn. Yeah, I, do, I just like the controlling element of it, I guess. That's where I'm getting at. Because uh, I actually, you know, turn in practice room, I beat Delver a few times with this deck. Yeah. And I think actually the, the primary reason for that is the sideboard. Uh, the sideboard is just four Fire Slingers, right? That's the guy who's a 1-1 one, one for two. And yeah. he's a pinger and he hits you for one, whenever you ping. 1-1 so, one, one for one. Say what? It's a 1-1 one, one for one. Yes. No, not 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 Goblin Fire Slinger. The just I think his oh. the card's actually just called Fire Slinger. Yes, the card is called Fire Slinger. Sorry about that. He's a Tempest card. He's a one one human wizard for one and a red, and you tap it to deal one damage to target creature or player, one damage oh, to you. That's okay. Yep. Yep. Then you have Forge Devil, which is the uh, Dark Ascension card, which is a uh, one mana one one. When it enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to target creature and one damage to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then you have two Vithian Stingers. Sorry, I, for, I forgot the numbers. So we have four Fire Slingers, two Forge Devils, and then two Vithian Stingers. And Vithian Stinger is the Unearth Pinger. Yes. Um, then you have four Lash Outs. And you may not know what this card does. Lash Out is a one and a red for an instant. Deals three damage to target creature. Clash with an opponent. If you win, Lash Out deals three damage to that creature's controller. So, this deck can base it's it's like it's almost like a transformational sideboard, right? Where it can uh, transform into like mono red control, basically. Is he already running uh, Searing Blaze main deck? Yes, four yeah. main deck Searing Blazes. Yeah. So. Sounds yeah. like fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. If you, uh, check out the channel Fireballs YouTube page, you can see him play it, and also in the sideboard, he's got three Smash to Smithereens, so. He did pretty well against Affinity. Yeah, that's a very good matchup for Burn. And and for those out there, he's probably one of my favorite Upper Brewers. So I, I always think you should go look and see what he's doing. Everything he does is not always great, but um, he's got some clever ideas a lot of the time. He, he's he's probably the cleverest brewer out there, I think, right now in Popper. Yeah, um, that means a lot coming from you. Yeah, I think he 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 takes he's really big on tweaking stuff, and he tweaks them in kind of odd ways. Like he had a mono blacklist that he added like paralyzed to, which is a single black enchant creature. I think it says it's been a long time since I read this card, but I think it says like tap target cool. creature. Yeah, tap target creature. You can't untap it ex unless you pay four during your upkeep. Yes. So it's kind of like a really big. Uh, claustrophobia and uh but the reason why that's kind of cute is because he's also running the great merchant build so it's another removal spell that sort of keeps creatures in play and buffs up your devotion count so he, he does stuff like that a lot and it's a lot of little clever things i don't know that it always makes decks better but um he always adds personal flair to, to stuff all right which is kind of fun to see yeah. uh so yeah, I've been testing that list a lot, and unfortunately for me, it's like uh, it's still burned, so I still can't 
it still can't run it successfully because, uh, well, it's burn. I took it to a lot of, I took it like to three eight mans and I lost a lot. And then I played Stompy and recouped most of the losses. So that was pretty good. Uh, what else am I doing? The Theros six booster sealed case, guys. Those are value. If you have, if you're not playing those, um, you need somewhere between fifty and sixty percent win to be effectively infinite. But I think they're actually the best thing, best value on Magic Online right now until daily events come back. The sealed, yep, this thing. Oh. Cute. No, no, no. The six, the Theros six booster sealed case. And there was an article I read on uh, on Pure about it, and uh, basically you need you need somewhere in the realm of like a fifty five, uh, like fifty three percent. They didn't do the exact math, but somewhere between fifty and sixty percent win ratio to go infinite on these things. So what they are is you you know you pay. Ralph Wickham's article, right? Uh, yes, yes. <clears throat> Ralph Wickham's article. Um, but yeah, you, it's it's just insane value. So I've been doing hammering out a lot of Theros sealed. Uh, here I'll link that in my show. I don't know where I'll link it, but I'll link it to you. And so you pay your six boosters and you pay your two tickets entry. And you get three boosters for each win you get. So given that the average value of a opened booster Theros is like one ticket roughly, you only need to have like 50% win percentage to go infinite on this thing. The and pack price has dropped since the article though, so it's more... Yeah, yeah. A little bit more, but it's still like the, the best way to play limited right now. And as much as I hate Theros, uh, I can't really turn down that value. And Theros isn't that bad that I'm not gonna play this because of that val because of the lack of value. Just to be the the math lawyer here, but I still think the new player drafts and the new player seals are better value than this. Yes, yes, new player. I think new player stuff is still better value, and yeah. but eh, well, that requires you to make counts over and over and over. So yeah, and some of yeah this is probably more uh, more fun competition <laughs> than the four months. Yeah, yeah and I don't think I could even do this though. I, I hate Theros. <laughs> I think it's like. It's yeah, terrible. I'm not doing it either. I haven't played a limited match of Theros yet. Yeah. I'm not even that like bad or anything. I normally enjoy a format relative to how good I am at it. So like, if I'm very good at a format, I'll love it. If I'm not that great at it, I'll hate it. And I'm like fine at Theros, but I hate it. It's just I think it's just very boring. Just the worst. <laughs> it's yeah. it's kind of like playing Hopper Hexproof versus Hexproof every single game. Yeah, it's just very similar. <laughs> you know, I hate it's it's a love hate relationship for me. I actually hate the draft, and I'm actually liking the sealed a lot. Yeah, they're very different formats. Strangely, yeah, they're very very different formats, right? And that's not usual that. That the formats are that different, but they really are. Because what always happens when I draft is I'll think an archetype is open, right? And I've done probably around 10 Theros drafts, and I'll be like, pack one, it's very obvious that like blue white heroes is open, right? I'm getting past a ton of blue white heroes, and I'm, I'm cutting it hard, and I'm taking everything that that deck wants, and then pack two, I get nothing. Uh, and just like stone cold nothing of the de of the deck that I that I was building for. I'm like. How did this happen? Um, so then pack three rolls around and I'll get stone cold nothing. I'm like, I was getting very obvious signals in the first pack that this is the deck that I should be going for and <laughs> then I get nothing in pack three. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. So my Theros drafts always just fail miserably. But sealed, they don't have the option to cut me. So I'm happy. <laughs> Yeah, drafting's a weird skill. I think I'm actually, I'm definitely a lot better at sealed than draft because I just don't think I'm the best signal reader in the world. But I'm pretty good at building the deck if you give me a pile of, pile of cards. Put, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the best signal reader in the world either, but, but man, I, I can, there are some times where it's just really obvious that you should be in an archetype and 
and then you just and Theros is the only format that's ever this has ever happened to me before. I guess Dragon's Maze too. Whenever it's full full block Dragon's Maze, it's kind of was really hard too. But uh, Theros is like this format where your signals are just it never seems to work out. It never seems to pan out for me. Like what I, what I should be taking vice, what I shouldn't be taking. And the only way I actually get any value off of Theros is if I open value. So people are passing like one ticks cards and stuff to me. So there was one draft where I got like four uh, four cards or like two ticks in value passed to me. Like two Nykthoses were passed to me and like a Hero's Downfall was passed to me in pack three. I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, I mean, if you guys are just going to pass me money, I'll take it. This is not in my colors. That's pr that's why that draft failed. But eh, there you go. Anyways, popper, 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 popper. popper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one more public service announcement: Trans Siberian Orchestra was awesome. There you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I went to I went to Trans Siberian Orchestra on Saturday or on Sunday with my kids, and it's a it's a laser light show. It was a lot of fun. Kids had a ton of fun, and. If you guys, if you get a chance to watch them, this is the last year they're touring ever, so go check them out. Popper. Yeah. Popper, popper. Guys, when uh, daily events come back, do you think that the price payout is changed? No, he specifically said in his article that it's not changing. Good. That's super good. The, the one thing I wanted to like talk to him about and sit down and be like, in answer it's just like why did you think it was ever necessary to do this yeah like there's still no explanation for why they, they took it down to begin with I think the only reasonable explanation is that there, there was a tournament size that about 200 people were part of the problem and the standard dailies were uh, that big yeah I think that there probably was a legitimate reason for it but uh, I would really like to know what it is. Yeah, yeah. I would have. I would have enjoyed. I would have understood at losing daily events if I, if they gave me any reasonable explanation for why I was taken down. Like any, just like <laughs> we're we're mildly concerned that this could impact the infrastructure. Like a daily event with two hundred people could impact the infrastructure, and we just want to see. We just want to look at it to see. I would have been like, okay, that's fine. I can understand that. But just no explanation for something that seemingly seems totally unrelated to the bigger problem to me. And, uh, and sure, so I could draw lines if I want to in my head, but so terrible. It's quite interesting that they uh, killed uh, the entire standard PTQ season. The way I interpret it is saying that uh, the PTQ season for Journey into Nyx is not happening on Magical Line. Uh, yeah, pretty much. That's what they said. And that's pretty big <laughs> for uh, standard prices. I don't know what will happen to uh, the value of standard cards. Yeah, that is kind of interesting. I didn't even think about that. Because a lot of your financial speculation is based on PTQ season. And yes, I'm very glad it didn't affect. Uh, I hope they fix it until uh, the next uh, the, the UE uh, PTQ season, which is uh, modern. Hmm. Yeah, I hope so. What is PTQ season? Can you tell me that? Like, what is the modern period of time that is PTQ season? Because I know that that's when people start to care about modern. Yeah, the modern PTQ season is in the summer. Okay. And it lasts for, like, May. Two months. Okay. Let's right. see if I can get the right exact dates here. Yes. Modern PTQ season from June 7th to August 24th, 2014. Qualifies you to UE uh, Pro Tour in Honolulu, Hawaii. Ooh, fun. Yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> what have you done uh, I was play, have you gone and played Magic there? No, no, no. I, uh, I, was, uh, I was stationed in Hawaii for three years. Oh, oh my god. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is not that exciting to me? <laughs> Man, I gotta look up like PTQs now for uh, for local PTQs. That's I'm gonna have to play Paper Magic. Dang it! 
can I talk finance now? You can. Yeah. Talk finance. Yay! Uh, I just want to mention what you said earlier, the, the flashback drafts and uh, especially the Mercadian masks draft happening uh, close to Christmas, but also the Tempest drafts happening today and what you should do with your proper cards. This might sound uh, excessive to sell everything, but the price variations are enormous. I, I sold everything from Tempest block this morning and there were like Rolling Thunders I bought for 19 cents. Uh, I sold for 312 and that's like 15 times the money in a year. Uh, so what you should be doing that immediately when you hear about uh, a flashback draft format coming, sell everything. Go to MTG or traders, uh, their buy bots, offer to sell it to them. If they refuse or if they pay uh, very little, go to wikiprice.com uh, and check what bots are paying and then you have to dump it. Because during the draft, and the low point is usually a week after the drafts, these flashback drafts are a little more expensive than the drafts used to be in 2012, so that might affect how many cards enter the format. But uh, they are also Swiss drafts, so that might make more people play. Uh, last year, it was very clear that the price was at the lowest uh, about a week after the drafts finished. So don't start buying... Uh, Lotus Petals uh, tomorrow, but wait until the drafts are over. And sometimes after the drafts are over, the, the prices will be lowest. And then buy like crazy, because in a year, everybody will have forgotten about this. Cryptrats were one tick a year ago, when they were drafted. And they're coming back, probably. I think they are giving us all the flashback drafts now, so I expect that Master's Edition and Mirage and stuff will show up. So be uh, be trigger happy and sell and buy a lot of poker cards now because they vary a lot in price. So if I I didn't get this announcement until right now, really. I mean, I saw you it have this to look at weekly announcements because Wizards are announcing stuff in so many different places. So the Magic Online weekly announcements is the best place to find it, apparently. Uh, Do you I still sell my stuff if I've already missed the selling window? Yes. Yeah, There's still time. The, the drafts haven't started yet. Oh. Two hours. They, <laughs> oh, so is is Magic Online like down currently? No, uh, not yet. I see. I think it goes down in an hour and a half. So yeah, log on and sell. <laughs> you know? okay. uh, sell, sell it now. Sell everything. Sell, sell, sell. Uh, uh, you can see, check the Goldfish curve because Goldfish is now tracking commons since the first of January this year. So, and the 1st of January is also a very good place to check how low the cards will go because uh, many things were drafted late 2012. So, for example, if you look at the price of Days and Gash on the January the 1st, they were just drafted when they were that low. Hmm. Okay. So, oh man, there was something I was going to say that was relevant. I, hate, I, I can hate also yeah, I can repeat my warning about Vintage Masters, because Vintage Masters will be drafted a lot more than these flashback drafts, so everything that's printed in uh, Vintage Masters will lose at least 90% of their value. Okay. That's but that's still six months ahead. Alright, All Lotus right. Petals. Getting Days and Lotus Petals, uh, I think, are pretty given in Vintage Masters. Is Lotus Petal that big in Vintage? Uh, yes. Okay. It's a one of in Vintage. It's uh, restricted. Oh. Well, there you go. <laughs> but it's uh, not restricted in Legacy, I think. No, it's not. It's, it's a big deal in Legacy. It's a much bigger deal in Legacy than in Vintage. Yes. Yeah. So... Just to give you an idea, the uh, pack prices for Tempest right now are like 10 tickets each. Yeah, 10.76 uh, cordon goldfish. What will happen is that uh, they will fall to four. Uh, they will be sold. Will they be sold in the store? I don't know, but they will fall to four tickets as they are being drafted and people can get them in the drafts. Uh, one usually falls further 
depending on the price structure. Uh, so if you play the Swiss, what booster do you get the least of? Um, it would do you have get, to be... Like, it's Exodus, right? I you think get the so. Tempest. So Exodus uh, will be much more expensive then. Okay. Uh, it depends a bit on the price, but the, the prices m will vary. But they will drop, so it's definitely no... You shouldn't buy the expensive boosters now. No, no, no. And of course, the main card you're looking for if you're drafting Tempest is Wasteland. Absolutely. So, there's the question then. Do I do I initially sell everything I get in drafting? Because I'm planning on drafting the crap out of this format. This is like one of my favorite formats of all time. It's like what got me into Magic. So, um, there's a lot of nostalgia for me. <laughs> Let, let's put it like this. If if the value is uh, 100% right before the draft, and then it starts to plummet, and you're drafting on the second day, maybe you're getting 85%, then you have to ask yourself, are you happy with 85% of the value, or do you just wait six months until it's full value again? Hmm. Uh, of course, with the six months window, then you have to think about Vintage Masters again, and Wasteland is probably being printed again. So, yeah, that's uh, a good point. Yeah, Wasteland's yeah. huge in Vintage, too. It's just yeah, big in so Vintage sell. Legacy, probably. Sell if it has not fallen more than 30%. Look at Goldfish. Okay. Well, I've never, well, I've never played Vintage. It's probably one of my favorite formats. <laughs> so, if you guys ever have questions about what might be in there, feel free. I've, I've I played so much Vintage in a Dark Past when I had all the power cards, and it was... Uh, well, you used to be a baller. Now you're a popper. What happened? Yeah, I sold <laughs> the cards. <laughs> I still have uh, one mox, actually. Oh, that's but, cool. Uh, sorry? So that's cool. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't think Vintage was a very... It, it might be more fun now, actually, but uh, when I played it, it was quite broken. <laughs> that's exactly why I like the format. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, turn one kills. That's yeah. magic, man. That is. But the cool part about Vintage is that they have ways to stop it, stop that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, every deck has to run four Force of Wills. That's why days is so expensive. Too, there's a lot of... I'm like, exaggerating. I have no idea how to play Vintage. If if you give me a Vintage deck, I could look at it and be like, how does this deck actually win? And I could it could be staring me right in the face. I wouldn't know it. Uh, I'm. I will fully admit that I'm a vintage noob. So all I know is what I hear. Yeah, there's a few decks that like get sphere effects down. Um, I, I actually use like a lot of vintage as models for my popper ports in a lot of ways. So like that blue red Delver deck that I had you test with me, Chris, was like Farley Rug Delver but also kind of partly shops a little bit, which is a vintage deck that uses uh, the Sphere Effects and, like, Lodestone Golem and uh, Mishra's Factory, I think. Workshop or Factory. Whichever one makes you tap for three colorless to make artifact mana. And so, like, when we had Heuristic Study, that was sort of, like, my attempt to add a Sphere Effect to the deck. Ah. Okay. So, yeah. It's a cool format. With some, and I mean, Popper can be almost as fast as as those older formats, anyway. So it's a good place to look for ideas. Hi, I want to speak for a short second about a format that will die because of Vintage Monsters, and that's Two Headed Giant Classic, which is uh, a format I played so much. I love Two Headed Giant Classic, but uh, with the introduction of Vintage Monsters and Power, it will be so broken <laughs> that yeah. everybody should be able to win on turn one. So. I don't really broken. understand how two headed giant works even. I've never done that. Either two versus two. And it, it actually for some reason doesn't work at all like paper two headed giant. It has different rules. Hmm. But me and Brandon are doing uh, uh, two headed giant every week now so there will be videos about that on Magic Gathering Strap. Oh, cool. I'll see. I'll watch one and see what that's actually like then. Yeah, I'm playing like Cloud Post, uh, Burning Wish, 
broken stuff. <laughs> so cast Emrakuls and Jinkitaxias <laughs> stuff. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It sounds uh, insane. 12 posts with Vesuvas. Meanwhile, I'm like casting Nettle Sentinels over here. <laughs> okay, back to Pauper then. <laughs> yeah, so you alright with Finance then, Dan? I mean, like, there's a lot of uh, interesting things that are happening with all these flashback drafts that are like, I don't want to say they're promised to us, but. Yeah, and this is a great opportunity to get into pauper and get full play sets of the cards if you were late into pauper and don't have like gushes and stuff get them now when these flashback drafts are happening so this you can get into pauper for buy you can get the whole play set of pauper probably if they do all the formats in the next uh, one and a half months yeah uh, for about 20 percent of the price you should put together a list of all the cards you think are going to be printed in uh, this vintage masters or whatever it's called, and uh, are, all the all those there are better minds to trying to do that. Uh, but all all the ones that are relative to popper, I think that'd yeah. be interesting to see. Because I mean, I well, I would like to know if I should sell my land grants for that set. You know, not that I your land grants should be sold because they are in Mercadia masks and it's being drafted before Christmas. Okay, so uh, a better example. Um, I don't know. I can't come up with one right now. But you know what I mean, like. Yeah. My crypt rats. Will that be in vintage masters? Probably not. But like. That would probably be in the mirage flashback drafts that uh, are okay. very likely. Getting you there, huh? Okay. Uh, <laughs> pestilence. <laughs> when the flashback drafts are done, uh, I could do that for vintage masters. Yes. Yeah, that'd be sweet. I'd, I'd like to know, get your take on, on what you expect. To yeah, see. the flashback drafts are uh, the big thing right now. I mean, this mess is still quite a long time away. Then I'll hold you very accountable if you're wrong on any of them. That's the problem with any finance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're, you're, always, you're always wrong some of the time, and then people just point at that and think that you're an idiot. <laughs> nope, nope, you're wrong. Your fault. Pay yeah. me. So what do you guys think you're going to do when the daily events come back? Like, what decks do you think you're looking to play? Uh, so your daily events come back on December 11th, so... I won't be able to play Delver. It's sad. I don't really know. I would play Delver, but I don't have the cards, so <laughs> I have to play something else. Yeah, so I'm not really buying Dazes until the, until the mass drafts are like well underway. Yep. Same thing with gushes and you know, I think both of those cards are really integral to any Delver list. So I am running a series on the Mercadian Mask Draft on mtgostraft.com and that will be done before uh, the Mercadian Mask Drafts actually start. It is the worst draft format in the world. Oh, I didn't good. think so uh, when I started playing it a year ago, but it was horrible. You you don't get twenty three playables. You never do, and the <laughs> playables you get are horrible, and uh, everything just sucks. And you never get the double deck. The fault of prophecy, because like I, I feel like just triple Mercadian masks could be pretty sweet. I also like Nemesis. I think that's a pretty cool set. So like Mercadian masks Nemesis, like that seems like it should go well. But then like I think there's actually zero playable cards in prophecy, and so. Basically, a third of the cards in each pack are totally unplayable. Yeah. Um, I might have mentioned this before, but Mercadian Mask Draft was actually the reason I started my YouTube channel. Because I was doing so poorly in them that I had to get feedback on my plays. So I decided to film and see where <laughs> that got me. <laughs> Dude, Ristic Study is in Invasion or in Prophecy. Yeah, oh, yeah, and I could go. never, could never break it. And it's terrible in draft. It's just horrible in draft, oh, okay. especially in that format where like, you're like, should I wait a turn to play this? Yes, I will because my opponent has done nothing. I'll just wait. <laughs> like, <laughs> nothing ever happens. You just, you sit, and then like once you get like a critical mass of one threes, you start beating in or something. Like it's just a brutal format. 
<laughs> how does that impact your expected prices, Dan? That's like that was the question I really wanted to ask you. Was just like how does Mercadian mass flux crappiness impact the likelihood or like deep price decreases and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was very clear last year actually because it was drafted right a week after or before Ursa block. And uh, the Ursa cards did drop more than the Mercadian mass cards did. Uh, so yes, it will affect, but the, the prices will still go down, and people will be drafting Mercadian mass because they have to get the cards. Yeah, I mean, sh- you're looking at one of the highest value cards in Magic Online is in Mercadian mask is rare. We should yes. import. And so, if you can like force yourself to enjoy Mercadian Mask uh, draft, then you have a, a big edge <laughs> over everyone. Yeah, you have two very high value cards in Mercadian Mask, which are uh, uh, Richard Import and Misdirection. So the yes. problem is that each pack you open is not necessarily like you're not even guaranteed uh, Mercadian Masks rare. You know, like you can each one of these packs is three different sets shuffled together and so i don't know i after the third like prophecy if i ever have like a triple prophecy rare draft i'm just gonna like just quit i'm just gonna be done because i will have made no money and have gotten terrible cards (laughs) and played a terrible format yeah (laughs) i think Uh, these drafts are uh one of the few draft formats where you actually are ex- your expected value is higher than zero because the the pack the expected pack value is so high there are so many valuable cards in it and uh, to judge this you, you have to look at the, the expected value not actually what happens of course there will be packs with no value but on the average this is uh, i don't know if there are any other packs with more value in it a mass block <clears throat> All right. Uh, so back to Popper. I think we're done with finance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you asked what what we're gonna play when the daily events come back, and I think the battle royale that uh, was hosted this past weekend by Casting Comments uh, is probably a good indicator of what you're gonna expect whenever the daily events come back. Delver was four out of the top eight card, uh, top eight decks in the player in this player run event. Uh, I played in this one too. Uh, I got fourth place in it. It was pretty sweet. After going X and two in the Swiss, I actually made top eight off of tiebreakers. I was eighth place off of tiebreakers and ended up in fourth. So Good huge deal. shout out to Casting Commons, J Siri, E Hustle for hosting this. It was it was sort of like one of those things that was it brought hope to us when we had no hope with the daily events. Like, hey, we can still run things that are decent value, even if Wizards isn't helping us at all. Yeah, the value in that uh, tournament was pretty good. Uh, value in that tournament was insane. Consider, I think 45 packs were given out. Wow. For no charge. For zero charge. All it, t- all it took you was your time. So. Yeah. Uh, so I got fourth place, won six packs, so it was pretty nice. Um. Delver One, of course, posted by Jack Sad. He's a longtime Delver player. Uh, your second place, though, was really interesting. It was Free from the Real. Ooh. Ooh. So I linked it in the show notes. Check out the deck list. I think you're going to like this one, David. It's pretty. It's pretty. Uh, pretty sweet list. I think I've played against it recently, actually. Who was playing um, it? Uh, somebody named Shido Likes Bugs. Okay. Uh, and it's. Brought on by the addition of Voyaging Seder, right? Isn't yes. that like kind of the main reason why it's seeing a bit of a revival? Yes. Voyaging Seder is, is one of the new tricks, right? It's just it's replacing the uh, Axe Pain Guardian engine. So now you have Arbor Elves and Voyaging Seders as your two untap engines. You don't have to have the Axe Pain Guardian. You can have either the Elf or the Seder as your engine. Which is pretty nice. Basically, it it adds additional redundancy to the list, which is very, very necessary. And he runs Giga Drowses, Train of Thoughts. I really like this list. It's very nice. Sweet. Um, so outside of Delver, then you had two Sage combo lists, Esper Sage combo lists. 
which were ran by like the two Esper familiar players, Raging Flump and Ministered by Angel. Angels. Yeah. And yeah, of, of the four people who play the deck, two of them. Yes. Yeah. The other the other players like Alfonso six 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 six, and then I don't remember who the other one is, but yeah, they're like four people who are designated to play Esper familiars, no matter what, and those are them. Yep. Uh, then the last list you had was Stompy. Uh, ran by a guy named Ender Emdier. Ender, who crushed me in the Swiss, and then I played him in the in top eight and beat him. Oh, that's so, always the worst when you <laughs> that happens to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out, so I played in the Swiss, right? And this guy named Ender cr uh, crushed me right in the Swiss, and then I played against Jack Sad, who was the winner of the tournament in the Swiss, and then I, you know, I beat Ender in uh, top eight, and then. My next round, I played against Jack Sad. So I was like, God, can you guys like not pair me against the two people who crushed me in the Swiss? That would be great. <laughs> How many players were there in the tournament? I think 19 or 20 total were in the tournament. And only one one land spy deck. Yes, Obson. I I think I I beat him in round one or something. Or round two. Yeah, he told me he played <laughs> three Delver decks. He oh like, no. You went like one and three. And his only win was a bye. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was unfortunate for him. Was that I knew, like, I, yeah, I paired against him in round one, and I knew he was probably playing the spy deck. I'm like, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry you had to get paired against me like this, but well, that's what happens. And you have dazes too, right? So I do. like, <laughs> it makes turn one even harder. Yes, it's. I do run days. Well, I did run dazes in the list, so. I was only running two though. Jack Sad was running three. So but yeah, it was a very very cool event. So big shout out to uh J Siri and E Hustle. I don't know if they're gonna run another one. They were talking about running another one, but then they announced yesterday that dailies are coming back, so maybe they're not gonna run one now. I don't yeah. know. I think if they do run one run another one then it's gonna be much lower value because I think this is more of like a J Siri J Siri did so much to uh to make sure that Fissure was banned, that he didn't want to see the format die, and that's the impression that he was getting from uh, from all the social media and uh, generally looking at Popper, uh, like eight mans and stuff. It's like he didn't want to see the format die that he worked so hard on to make sure that it was actually an enjoyable format again. So he hosted yeah. this thing, paid money out of his own pocket to the to the winners, the top eighters, and. So he did a lot, and he continues to do a lot for the popper community. So I'm surprised they didn't get more players. I don't know why that is. That's just really. It wasn't the best marketing, I don't think. But the the problem is, like, it's just very very difficult for to to market properly, like, throughout our community. I, I feel I, I just it it takes a long time because the best way to do it right is to get all the popper figureheads to to write in and care about it but i think that they kind of put this idea together um or maybe they didn't put it together quick i don't know but it just seemed like i got wind of it like about a week before and yeah. i think you have to get it out a little bit earlier than that because by the time we you know got around to talking about it on our podcast it was like just a few days before the event um, I never had a chance to put it in any of my articles or anything like that so it's I think if they had another week to do it it, it would have gotten a lot more people myself but I felt I feel like Jay, Jason felt that there was a pressing need to rally the troops sort of um, yep and, and it seems like it came at a perfect time I think that that one tournament will keep enough people in Popper till December 11th I mean, that's right around yeah, the corner. I think Popper will have no problem on December 11th. Yeah, me neither. But I mean, his his concerns are valid. We, I mean, my article that I was going to put out this week was basically on how terrible Wizards treats the Popper community, and using the daily events as like a as an example. But I've decided to to pull it in lieu of this new announcement. But 
Um, I mean, everything Jason's feeling is the same stuff I, I'm feeling, and it seems like you guys have acknowledged too to me. So it's those are scary times. It's a good thing that Wizards is giving us back the dailies. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a really rough time for me. I I had strongly considered selling out myself, and uh, because they just their communication. I th- the biggest problem I think with the whole issue was just their complete lack of communication, and that's what really annoyed me the most. And I had strongly considered just selling out of Magic Online, so I wasn't. I didn't have faith that they were gonna tell us anything before it before it'd be too late. So. Yeah, I think CJ said it well where he said, or they, Wizards was like, by the end of the year, we hope to be able to tell you something. Like, that is so sketchy. <laughs> yeah. And provides no faith that they'll ever fix it. Yeah, I mean, I, I had an email chain with you guys where I was just like, I'm just not so sure at all anymore, so... This is uh, one of the things that I have to take in consideration with, about whether I stay with Magic Online or not, or if I sell out and just go with paper, because I, you know, my paper events are not going to crash because you guys have a crappy infrastructure. Glad you didn't. No, no. I, uh, yeah, and like, what if, and I imagine that the a lot of people would be feeling the same way as you if this announcement didn't come, and then we get to the new year. Wizard still has nothing to tell us. Like I, I think at that point, the popper community would would be would be doomed. And I think um, it's very fortunate that they've decided to give us back these dailies when they did. And it's very fortunate that Jay Siri put on this tournament when he did to keep revitalized or keep, to revitalize the the popper community um, and keep people in it. Because um, I mean, I was talking to you yesterday. The eight mans are firing at, like, two an hour. That's so few, you know? I was quite impressed yesterday when I played the eight months, actually, and that uh, I I play on European work hours. That's, like, the emptiest time on Magic Online. (laughs) And uh, they fired. Uh, I had to wait, like, 30, 40 minutes, but they did fire, and I thought (laughs) they might not. Yeah. I Yeah. uh, I have definitely, like... Entered an eight man and then forgot that I entered an eight man and I entered something else like a draft or something. Oh, and so like I'm drafting and I'm drafting and I'm drafting and all of a sudden my match comes up and I'm like, oh crap, I forgot I was in an eight man. <laughs> oh, so that's that's where your experience in multi tabling comes from. Yeah, because I'm, I'm waiting so long for the eight mans, or whatever. Because I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes I play at, re- at weird hours or like very late hours. Last night I played an eight man at like ten thirty p.m. here, so which is uh, probably one of the weakest times. But I was in a I was in a Thero six booster sealed, so it was actually firing per- firing pretty well. So I was in my six booster sealed, and I was building my deck and everything. And I'm like, eh, I don't want to play this color. I don't want to play this color. And all of a sudden, my, a match pops up. I'm like, what the hell just happened to me? <laughs> Luckily, I was in. A, I played Stompy in that eight man, so I was like, "Yes, okay, cool. I can finish this off real quick, and then go back to building my boosters, my sealed deck." <laughs> so yeah, the eight mans aren't they aren't firing often. Like prime time during the during the U.S., I've seen they fire pretty frequently though. So like yeah. four p.m. to roughly eight p.m., they fire a lot. They're firing more like five or six times an hour. But when day eight mans first came out, it was like one two three four five six seven eight ah. one two three four five six seven eight ah. like it was it was fast like people were excited you know they were like here's this new thing like maybe I don't have dailies but at least I got eight man so I'm gonna hop in now because I can do it and then it's just like boom 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 and now it's like boom and then like twenty minutes later boom you know it's just the, the rate is decreasing, has decreased so much from when they first came out that I, I mean, it was just further evidence to me that, like, something needs to, to change because otherwise, eventually, they just will stop firing. Yeah. Uh, they just, the value on them was so low that people are like, yeah, I can't maintain this, right? It's nice to get these in every once in a while. And it's, I think that's where the eight man's were residing with like standard modern before well, we still had dailies is that those things still fired they didn't fire a lot but you know they still fired even though the value was so much worse than daily events those things actually did still fire so 
I have yeah. a positive prediction to make. I think that with uh, with the flashback drafts, with daily events returning, we will have Pauper will be even more even healthier than before, and the biggest daily ever will happen before February first. Okay, sweet. I think that's very very likely. And I have a. Do you guys know if they're taking the eight mans down when the dailies come back up, or do we get to keep those? I don't know. I would still, if, I would still play in dailies, or, or I would still play in eight mans if they still had them. I yeah, I would too. I mean, they're just like, they're convenient, you know? If you want to get in some testing at a competitive level, I'd rather, if I have some time to spare, I'd rather get in, it, in an eight-man than two-mans, because two-mans are like, sometimes just an extension of the casual rooms. I think they will uh, take them down when they stop firing. I don't know, because they never, like, the singleton formats never fire. The legacy eight-mans never fire, and they never... They never took those down. That's true. So. Well, I hope they stay. We've been fighting for them so long that now that we have them, it's it's overshadowed by the fact that dailies went away. Yeah. This could actually ultimately be the best thing that's happened to Popper in quite a long time. If if we actually get the daily events back and people return it with the same level of excitement as before. Thank yeah. you, Brian Kibler. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should be <laughs> bowing before him. Yeah. <laughs> um, Alright, so moving on. We've got a bunch of news articles here, and I'll link those in the show notes. I'm not going to talk about them too long. I have a pure article, but I, but I talked about standard, so I guess that's the other thing I did this week. I played I, I played a player-run event with st- in standard and took a green-white aggro deck to a 4 out. It was pretty sweet. Uh... Then we have your thought cast, which is basically exactly what co- was covered in our last podcast, where you talked about how to build for eight mans. Yeah, which is now pretty much useless, but okay. It's just totally obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a couple of uh, gathering event reports because we don't really have a metagame right now, so hey, gathering is our metagame, even though it's player-run events and totally casual. But it's some of the decks you can expect to see whenever this or whenever daily events come back is based on these event reports. I'll leave, that, I'll leave those back in the show notes. Uh, we got some feedback, and I think we covered it pretty well. Uh, discussed the feedback with you guys, but... What uh, feedback? The feedback from J-Siri. Oh, yeah. That was good stuff. Thanks again, J-Siri. You continue to contribute to us. So... Um... I think we're going to go ahead and close it out. How can we get in contact with you, Dan? Uh, you can reach me on YouTube at uh, Magic Gathering Strat or on mtgostrat.com or on f- Facebook, uh, also Magic Gathering Strat. I am no longer on Twitter, actually. I decided to that I had time only for one social network. Boo. Dan or <laughs> David? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at shapeofwaffle5. You can read my articles at mtgostrat.com. I do the ThoughtCast series. I try to put out an article once a week on Wednesdays, roughly. Um, or you can find me in my car at the corner of Lexington and Larpenter. <laughs> 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 All right, so if you want to stalk David, that's where you can stalk him at. Yeah. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm not going to tell you where I'm at right now, but it, but it rhymes with mouse. Uh you can contact me on Twitter at cweaver8518, and I'm on MTGO at cweaver. Uh, that's it, guys. This has been Competitive Podcast episode 15. Thanks for listening. <laughs>